defining a collective mission and vision. We have two uh, distinguished speakers, and I will introduce them one at a time right before they speak. The first will be Guy Latreciano, and I hope I didn't butcher that That's too cool badly, <laughs> <laughs> who I know fairly well, and we're pleased to have you here. He's Associate Dean and innovative and of Innovative and Collaborative Pedagogy and Associate Professor of Clinical Research and Leadership at George Washington University. Uh, Guy is an expert in team science and collaborations. Um, a lot of his work has addressed uh, the, the need to develop skills and attitudes in knowledge producing teams that have led to innovation and truly cross-disciplinary outcomes. So his interests include things like um, uh, education, uh, cross-disciplinary education and theory, applied complexity science principles and their use in team development. And if you missed it earlier, he's also president-elect of the International Network, Network for the Science of Team Science. Or perhaps you are already president. president. Okay, he is president <laughs> now. I want to thank Margaret and the team to, uh, for inviting me here. I thought it would be a great idea if we spent three hours working on a mission statement, because I know everyone loves to do that, and it's very productive use of time. I'm kidding with you. I know that's the last thing you, I hope, you expected me to do. Um, we are not going to create a mission statement, but rather talk about the mission of what it means to um, embrace some of the themes we've been talking about today. Um, I, I was saying to Carrie in her office, that rich conversation we had when we first started is usually the type of conversation you have at the end of a workshop. Um, so we really started off great. <laughs> I thought these folks really get it. So it gave a great place to start and to move forward. So what I'm gonna try to do in the next 20 minutes is to introduce a pipeline concept of team science, and you'll see what I mean in a minute by that. Explore some of the ways team science is working to inform scientific teaming. Um, I also wanted to highlight resources that when you get the soft copy of the slides, you can go and, you know, pull. Um, it's always, I think, important when we do um, any sort of workshop that you get to have, you know, party favors to take home with you. And I try to include as many as possible that I know you can access either virtually or otherwise. I looked up what the mission was of um, ExcelNet, and something that really grabbed my attention was where it says it's a program to accelerate the process of scientific discovery and prepare the next generation of U.S. researchers for multi-team international collaborations. I think that's an important part of this mission that we cannot lose sight of. It's not just to make our work um, more, or, or the work you're involved with, um, accelerate, but rather to change almost paradigmatically the way that we go about science so that while we're doing science, we're creating a new generation of scientists that can learn from the way we're doing it. So something to consider is you'll hear the term the science of team science a lot. Um, and that's really just a fancy term for those of us who study teams and try to learn through evidence-based research what teams do, you know, how they work effectively, how they work ineffectively sometimes. But something we tend to forget is what is the role of the scientist in those situations? I just wanted to draw attention to the differences here in this terminology. So the science of teams is really trying to understand how through transcending any one disciplinary perspective or epistemological perspective, um, and uh, what the application of new methodological or conceptual frameworks are when teams work together, the study of that. But we also have to consider the role of scientists. And really, scientists and teams change their identity and how they view themselves. They have to. Otherwise, the first doesn't work at all. Otherwise, we're just sort of giving lip service to it. And that always is the thing I think scientists always get a little weird when I bring that up. It's like, what do you mean I have to change my identity? Well, we are all highly identified by the way we've been trained. In fact, it's almost impossible for some of us to disconnect 
from the epistemological or methodological approaches that we've taken and we've received that indoctrination through our traditional training, it's almost impossible to s completely separate ourselves from it. But if we have this ex uh, expectation that we can change and probably should change once we start to interface with other people, especially in teams that are trying to produce knowledge, it really changes up why we even do team science in the first place. It's so that we are entering into a change environment that is going to affect us, it's going to affect our ability and the effectiveness of the team to actually do or possibly solve the problems that the research requires. Um, before we go too far, in your folders, whoops, there's a one pager, it's back and forth, like this, front and back. Oops. And I want to uh, draw your attention to it. Um, this is something you can take home and try. Um, I use this activity with folks um, that are trying to sort of, oftentimes trying to start out somewhere. Where do we start? How do we all sort of get on the same page? Um, and this is an activity that tries to develop trust, a very important dynamic in forging new teams um, and to sustain new teams. As they start to figure out what is it that we find are, is important about what we're about to do. So, the concepts here, and I'm, we're not going to do this. This is for you to take home and maybe try it out if you'd like. But I think it illustrates some of the concepts that I'm going to talk about. So this idea of looking to the future, why are we coming together? It's to, to reach some sort of future state of a situation. Otherwise, we would simply go the path we've been going. Oftentimes, don't forget, scientific teams are forged to accomplish something that we know is unaccomplishable as an individual, right, as an individual researcher. So this is an opportunity to get the whole system in the room. We're talking about networks and networks of networks and sometimes getting them all physically in the same room. Think of it metaphorically, getting everyone on the same page or in the same room. Exploring all aspects of the system before trying to fix any one part. You know, before we get into arguments over you should do it our way or you should do it their way or just sit down and try to paint a picture of the landscape that you're trying to um, get your, your head around in your scientific team with the stakeholders that you're trying to engage with. Uh, put common ground and future actions front and center. Treating problems and conflicts as information, not action items. Don't, so basically, don't fix. Just try to get a hold of what's going on and how you might just sort of deal with it, not fix it. Because some things you want to fix sometimes shouldn't have been fixed in the first place, okay? And this, especially if those of you who think conflict is something that you should flatten all the time, sometimes the best conflicts yield the best results. <laughs> so be careful not to create in your mind a utopia of what teaming should be before you take the time to think about what is it that we have in front of us? Because it might be golden, and by the time you're done, it's going to be bronze. You know, so be careful there. Have people accept responsibility for their own work, conclusions, and action plans. So basically, this, and this is not a homework assignment. You could take it home and peruse it. It's an opportunity to explore what a collective mental model of the team could be using individual perspective to build it. Now, unlike doing a mission statement up on whiteboards, you know, we've all been there, right? Um, <laughs> and like it or not, we've been there, um, trying to construct just the right combination of words to capture, you know, everything that um, uh, the entire team might be feeling at that particular time. We sometimes forget that teams are individuals and teams of teams are not all in the same place at the same time. So no one episodic point in time is going to capture any of it. In fact, mission statements are often those things where we look back and say, ooh, we wrote that five years ago. Let's just take that off the website now and rethink it, okay? So as you take a look at this sort of activity, and it's just an example, this is something you can do very simply with your team to, and, and I think it's particularly important when you're talking about large, expansive teams, to truly try to understand what are the dynamics, before we try to construct the perfect house, what materials are we working with? And this is just an example. 
but I, um, I, I thought it was a good sort of segue. I was going to do this at the end of the presentation to the presenters prior um, uh, because I thought this might be something to think about as we move forward. So team science, and I always laugh, and Margaret is right, we know each other pretty well, where she said, Guy might get a, twinge, uh, a little twinge in his eye when I say this. Part of the challenge in team science is understanding that it's really an interdiscipline. And it is inherently a, a discipline that's evolving from a multiplicity of disciplines, all with their own uh, favorite epistemological approaches, et cetera, et cetera. So often, I know in teaching doctoral students, for instance, they come back and said, I did the search, but I didn't find anything. It's like, well, how many databases did you try it out on? And being in health and medicine, they say, oh, PubMed. It's like, well, guess what? All of knowledge is not on PubMed. <laughs> you know, so, so you have to understand that inherent into the study of uh, team science is the fact that we are interdisciplinarians. Some of us very embedded in our disciplines, other of us trying to bridge the gaps um, across disciplines. Oh, and I wanted to draw your attention. If you have particular interest, you can go to a Mendeley site that is managed by the team science community. This is very organic. Some of you may be familiar with it, where we try to bring together our literature that comes from everywhere. Um, and it actually, I found, has been very helpful to people who have trouble um, sort of navigating the breadth of our literature. Um, so here are some definitions that I think are helpful. I mentioned them before. What is team science? It's research conducted by more than one individual in an interdependent fashion. Um, that is not having a staff that works for you. That is being part of a team that is in a reciprocal relationship. Uh, the science of team science, as I explained, is the study of teams, the empirical study of teams. We often talk about the concept of knowledge producing teams, which are different than other types of teams that are task oriented in my own area. It's the difference between research teams and like, for instance, healthcare teams. Um, I think someone else brought up, Margaret brought up surgical teams. You know, surgical teams don't walk in saying, let's, you know, let's social dynamic our way through this. No, that's not <laughs> what they do. They have a very strict set of protocols, and many other teams do. You, you, I'm sure you'd be happy to know that um, uh, your pilots have protocols that they follow. They're not just saying, oh, let's try it this way this time, you know. <laughs> so research teams, knowledge producing teams are quite a different bird, and we oftentimes focus specifically on the differences between the, the activity of producing knowledge or having the goal of producing knowledge and rather doing other types of teaming. We sometimes forget there's major differences there. Um, lately, I've been thinking about when we talk about a lot of the themes that have come up already today about how they fit in a pipeline. Now, this is the mission part of the talk here. Imagine, for instance, if we were trying to encapsulize all these points we're bringing up about the way we train students, the way we promote people, the problems with funding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Lately, I've been trying to figure out how this contributes to the life cycle of what it means to be a team scientist, okay? And you're going to learn quite quickly that we don't exactly perpetuate <laughs> team scientists very well along the life cycle. But I just want to draw attention to what some of these dynamics are. So many of you, and I don't know everyone's projects, um, many of you are going to be interfacing with students who are, are learning. Um, you're also going to be dealing with either juniors, in whatever case, doesn't have to be academic, that are trying to establish themselves. Maybe you're trying to establish yourself. Making a point for why team science should be an institutional priority in whatever way. Um, sustaining collaborations. We just talked about that. What happens when you're on two different funding cycles? You know, how do you sus sustain the work? And then, you know, mentoring scientists to be team members. Um, and that conundrum within itself. Senior scientists want their junior people to succeed. Well, are we telling them this is the way to get the brass, you know, ring, or this is the way I really want to see you work throughout the rest of your career. Those are two different messages. So let's talk about this life cycle a little bit. First is the idea of developmental training. 
Training new scientists. How are we training new scientists? These are the objectives, of course. Engaging, rewarding, and assessing teams in the learning environment. Team development amidst, amidst individual development. This is all part of the learning process of uh, becoming a team um, scientist. The challenges, of course, are how do we measure team engagement, uh, excuse me, in, um, engagement and effectiveness. This has come up, right? What are the objectives around teaming and the set of core skills needed? Do you have clearly in your mind, what are the teaming skills that you and your team actually should be embracing and exercising and sharpening up at all times so that you can be a scientific team? And then, of course, the measurement uh, along with the individual and also um, the team level measurement that's going to lead to giving you some insight into um, um, if you're in fact meeting the mark. Um, here's an example. I'm going to let you read this later just in case um, I run out of time. But um, here is an assessment. There are assessments available. Um, I can provide more of these <laughs> um, to put into your package that can be used on your team to assess effectiveness in very many different ways. Here are some projects to follow. Again, you're going to have this in soft copy. The um, Center for Leading Innovation Collaboration that's funded by NCATS at NIH, Sysync, of course. The Team Science Education and Training Facebook, believe it or not, there's a Facebook for that, and Special Interest Groups in Insights, which includes Team Science Training. Okay, this is all part of that first phase. And these are resources that you can access and use. In the professionalizing team phase, we're trying to um, establish professions in professions. There's those of us who study team science, and that's our job, and we were hired for it, and so goes it. Then there's those of us who studied epidemiology, you know, um, anything else, you know, um, biotechnology, whatever, and now they're going into professions. In those professions, are you going to be rewarded for being a team scientist in that profession or in that discipline, okay? So part of the objective here is professionalizing teams so that people can actually go into environments where they actually are paid to be team scientists and not simply one-offs, okay? The challenges, of course, are to focus on practical problems, not just theoretical ones that are science for science sake, and the lack of incentives and reward systems for those types of people. I don't need to go into the details of the horror stories of people that were the best collaborators you ever worked with, but somehow they didn't get tenure, okay? That's what we're talking about here. Can we create a pipeline of professionalism that allows people who are professional collaborators to compete and to succeed in a pipeline instead of having to be an individualized sort of researcher. There is an article that has been published last year by um, uh, Julie Thompson Klein and um, Holly Falk Kaczynski that talks about this exactly and more specifically in the context of academia and how our reward systems are problematic for people to actually excel in team science, and I invite you to read that. Um, you can look that up later. Um, there are also some other examples here. I want to draw your attention to the fact there are some associations and universities that are going out of their way to make sure that um, uh, criteria change so that um, uh, team scientists can actually be rewarded and succeed in their fields. Institutionalizing team science is really getting to a point where we start to normalize that that is the type of science we want to do in the institutions which we live in. We've talked about some of these issues already. And the challenges, of course, are funding streams that reward science conducted in teams. That's come up already, right? And developing metrics for evaluation that evaluate teams. This is a good example. This I wasn't going to show you this. NSF, the ERC program model. Some of you may be familiar with this. That's a really good example. I was educated when I became a reviewer and realized that there was a lot of weight put into that collaborative plan against the scientific ideas and resources that you can look up. Sustaining that collaboration, which we aspire to and is part of our mission, is equally important as um, as um, Jessica brought up, but embracing the values of team science, sensitized, being sensitized to team readiness, and measuring organizational readiness 
so that we can sustain those things. And the challenges are, of course, um, measurement and evidence, which is always a problem, and uh, scholarly and practical materials necessary, and more resources there. And lastly, mentoring team members. I think this is really one of the most important phases here, because how many people here, you don't have to raise your hand, have in the course of mentoring said, well, this is how I learned it. <laughs> You know, we've all done it, and it's natural. We go back to our own experience. But in the team science pipeline, some of us have to start to think, okay, how do I need to mentor younger folks, junior faculty, the generation behind me, whatever, so that they are supported and they are shaped so that they become team science naturalists and not something that they sort of um, come out of their developmental training and have to sort of rethink everything they were taught. Um, and um, I'm going to stop there. I wasn't going to show you the slide, so I'll just go backwards. I'm going to stop there because I'm out of time, but we'll have time in questions to talk about some of these. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thank you. Uh, now it's my um, pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Roberto Delgado. He's program director of the Arctic Observing Network at NSF's Office of Polar Programs. And he's uh, pivotal to helping manage NSF's navigating the new Arctic big idea. He co-leads the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee's IARPC. <laughs> That's one more acronym. Environmental Intelligence Collaborative Team. That's a mouthful. He represents the U.S. in the Circumpolar and International Sustaining Arctic Observing Networks. And prior to being at NSF, he was a program chief at the NIH. Um, and he previously held research faculty positions at Hunter College of the City of, um, City of University of New York and the University of California. So welcome. Thank you, Margaret, for the introduction. Uh, just quick correction, University of Southern California. You said University of California. Big rivalry there, right? So anyway, Trojans, not Bruins or bears or, or anteaters or banana slugs. Um, so I appreciate um, participants um, in person, online viewers, as well as the organizing committee, uh, my colleague Claire as well for helping support this workshop. Um, I'm going to take a little bit different tack than what you've heard thus far today and really sort of home in on uh, a case study, specifically with the Arctic observing networks that I'm involved in at different scales, and try to share with you some best practices, some lessons learned, um, a lot of which will reinforce what we've already heard about collaborations and leadership and management, et cetera. And so hopefully uh, this will just be an example that reaffirms uh, some of the, the approaches and techniques that we've been learning about or, or refreshing ourselves about today. Um, so let me give you a little bit more context as well um, in terms of how I fit in or my, my, my program and where um, I'm going to take you for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, so as Margaret said, I am a program director in the Office of Polar Programs, National Science Foundation. I manage the Arctic Observing Network, which is one of four science programs in the Arctic, the section for Arctic Sciences. Some of you may be familiar with the section for Antarctic Sciences as well. That's the other side of the house. The other three science programs include natural sciences, social sciences, and system sciences. Um, however, the observing network is a little bit different in that I'm uh, allowed to fund projects for five years instead of three years and really focus on uh, several different what I like to consider pillars. Um, these include instrumentation and deployment of new observing systems, as well as the development of observing networks, um, both domestically and internationally, as well as efforts to support data access and management. And the slide just shows you sort of the brief overview of what uh, NSF Aon granting program uh, oversees. Now, um, as an example, I have a wide portfolio that encompasses atmospheric sciences, terrestrial science, sea ice, uh, permafrost, as well as community observing. Um, and together, this, this broad, diverse portfolio forms its own network. Uh, so hence the, the Aon title here. And so this is an example. There's an Arctic Great Rivers Observatory. There's local observations. Um, there's an uh, international tundra experiment. Uh, there's a Greenland ice sheet monitoring network as well. So you can see a very diverse group of 
interdisciplinary scientists, we're talking um, you know, glaciologists and oceanographers, terrestrial ecologists, uh, social scientists, uh, who are all part of this single Arctic Observing Network portfolio. So that's one level. Now, if you take it a step up uh, and remember this uh, IARPIC, Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee um, that Margaret mentioned that I, I serve on uh, as a co-lead for a collaboration team on environmental intelligence, we also have the interagency domestic uh, network. And um, this requires me to coordinate and communicate with other federal agencies like NASA, like NOAA, like the Department of Energy on similar types of programs where they are engaged in different forms of Arctic observing. So as an example, the Department of Energy um, has their next generation of ecosystem experiments, or ENGI. They have an Arctic program that is largely focused on, on permafrost. NASA has several different campaigns uh, from their cryospheric sciences and also their Earth observation programs, including ICEBRIDGE, ISAT. These are all acronyms some you may or may not be familiar with. but basically focusing on overflights or satellite imaging to uh, basically monitor and, and observe changes in ice composition and, and uh, coverage over, over the Arctic um, and Antarctic in some cases. Um, there's also an Arctic boreal um, vulnerability experiment that, that overlaps with Arctic observing. Um, and NOAA has, of course, their six line offices, including their Office of um, Oceanic and Arctic uh, Atmospheric Research, the National Marine Fisheries, Ocean Sciences, National Weather Service, and many of the scientists and, and researchers who are supported through those agencies also overlap with my portfolio. And so um, it really behooves us to be coordinating through the interagency on the types of um, different systems that are being observed and, and monitored over the course of um, our support. Um, so that brings me to, to you know, the national level. Um, but then furthermore, um, what I really want to focus on uh, in the remaining time is the international, the circumpolar Arctic, uh, sustaining Arctic observing networks, which is a joint effort that originally was started through the Arctic Council, which is a small intergovernmental organization that focuses on sustainable development and environmental conservation, as well as the International Arctic Science Committee. And the bullets here show you what the, the overall mission and vision of SEON is. Um, and I'll begin telling you a little bit more about the goals and how the, the mechanics work with respect to some of the, the concepts and ideas we've heard earlier in the day. So to start off, just remind you of what the goals are of the SEON. I'll be using the acronym SEON, representing Sustaining Arctic Observing Networks. Um, and they are to create a roadmap uh, to a well-integrated Arctic observing system. And well-integrated takes on different definitions depending on, on who you talk to. Um, but what is also really key and consistent with the US AON network, as well as the NSF AON program that I direct, uh, promoting free and ethically open access to observational data, um, as well ensuring sustainability, which we've been hearing, at, which we've been hearing a lot about today. Um, and that third goal, um, as, as we'll, we'll come to know or we'll come to learn, is one of the more challenging ones to, to really implement. So um, I want to borrow a little bit from, from Guy's presentation. Um, he showed us sort of the developmental stages of team science and team science approaches. Um, and within the SEON uh, initiative, there are two of those components that, that really resonate. Uh, one is the institutionalizing the team science aspect, uh, where the research is driven by a specific and compelling challenge. And that is to, again, develop this sustained integrative Arctic observing framework um, internationally uh, among nation states, permanent participants or representatives of indigenous organizations across the Arctic, intergovernmental organizations, some nonprofits as appropriate, um, and other uh, Arctic stakeholders. Second point from the institutionalizing a team science approach is that there is this deep integration disciplines. As I sort of began my presentation just remarking on the diversity of my portfolio, again, you have different uh, collective of scientists working together in um, a cooperative fashion to um, try to minimize the gaps in observational data across the Arctic in an effort to, to increase our scientific understanding, improve uh, forecasting and global modeling efforts, as well as to make those, those, dat those data readily, readily accessible. 
So that's really key. Um, and I could have also mentioned there are other networks within NSF, for example, long-term ecological research programs, um, including one that I manage in the Arctic. Um, there's also, um, yeah, th that's one of the, the main ones. And plus the Navigating the New Arctic, which, which Guy was kind enough to mention as well, and, and I helped uh, manage that, that initiative. Uh, there are many um, new projects that are, that are in the uh, process of being awarded right now um, that really bring that convergence team science approach, integrating natural sciences, social sciences, and the built environment or the engineering aspect. Um, but to get back to, to um, the SEAN initiative, and another aspect that I drew from, from Guy's presentation, that of sustaining the collaboration, uh, which I think we all learn, or many of us have learned through experience, can be really, really challenging. Uh, working with international partners, language, cultural differences, not to mention time zones and trying to schedule joint calls. Um, the members uh, of the SEON are, are, are global and span at least 10, not 12, time zones. And so some folks are still in their pajamas in the morning um, or getting ready to, to go to bed, but yet um, make the effort and uh, have the enthusiasm to to pr participate and engage actively. Um, but um, a couple of the points that I took away from, from Guy's presentation was this idea of continuing and ongoing encouragement. Um, there is a real um, strong incentive and motivation among the participants and members of the SEON initiative uh, across the states, across the na nation states, to to really achieve the, the, the previously stated goals. Um, and also the measurement and evidence, um, as Guy mentioned, was it, it, it remains a challenge because, again, you, you are looking at different types of data streams from atmospheric sciences, ocean sciences, terrestrial ecology, social science research, um, and someone at the end of the day has to find a way to, to, to integrate those different data to improve forecasting and, and global earth models. And so uh, let me dig a little bit deeper into the, the mechanics of SEON, uh, its membership, its governance structure, and how we coordinate, communicate, um, and try to advance the, the, the goals. So um, sustaining Arctic observing networks, again, is um, broadly international. Um, all interested, all interested parties are welcome uh, through different national bodies, uh, and we have partners from, from Europe and Asia, uh, certainly North America. It includes all the eight Arctic Council nations, um, as well as non-Arctic Council countries, such as China, Germany, Italy, and the ones listed here. Indigenous organizations, as I mentioned, through the Arctic Council, they're, they're referred to as permanent participants. Uh, the primary players in, in SEON include the Aleut International Association, Inuit Circumpolar Council, and SAMI Council, as well as other intergovernmental partners, including the World Meteorological Organization. And as I mentioned earlier, um, this is a joint effort that was initiated through the Arctic Council uh, alongside the International Arctic Science Committee, sort of uh, this broad professional organization for, for Arctic science. Moving ahead and thinking about governance, given the extent, the broad participation or broad membership of this group, um, there's actually a very, very sort of um, formal uh, governance structure that includes a board, an executive committee, a secretariat, which is where the, the leadership aspects come, th come through, as well as the coordination and communication, making us sure that we have um, you know, scheduled calls uh, well in advance, uh, proposed agenda, um, the appropriate, the correct call-in information, et cetera. Um, and then there are other sort of uh, supporting aspects, including uh, a recently stood up roadmap task force, which again puts us um, in line to a specific goal. Um, and the other partners are also involved as appropriate. On the right-hand side, I note that uh, while there is a, this broad exec board, board and exec committee for SEON, there are actually two committees um, that do a lot of the work, basically are, are essentially the, the working groups. And the way that this is formalized is through a lot of reference documents. And so um, I really liked how Margaret laid out some of the, the key features of successful or best practices in uh, uh, networks of networks, things like face-to-face -face communication, uh, or face-to-face -face meetings, rather, communication, the accountability, rules, and leadership. I didn't 
use them all, but those are things that really resonated with, with my experience in the SEON initiative. And so um, the new declaration uh, was an Arctic Council ministerial document where it established the SEON initiative. Uh, subsequent to that, there was a term of reference document for the board. Uh, subsequent to that, with stakeholder input from the different partners and stakeholders, an implementation plan was developed, terms of reference for the committees, which I'll go into uh, shortly. Uh, there was even an external review within the first five years. To, to really sort of um, do a course adjustment, uh, you know, making, um, uh, assuring that the SEON initiative and the activities were on the right track. Uh, and so all of these documents um, are made readily accessible to the membership and to the public um, through an online portal, arcticobserving.org. One thing I forgot to put on these slides, but uh, if you Google SEON, arcticobserving.org, you'll go to this nice portal website, which includes many of these reference documents about membership of the board, the partners. They are now, last time I checked, about 24 different international partners involved. Um, and had a lot of other reference supporting material there. Um, in the last few years, there's been a little bit more effort uh, towards moving from a from uh, sort of the strategy implement uh, from the strategy to an implementation. Um, there was even a study uh, produced by the Science and Technology Science and Technology Policy Institute or STIPI um, that. Uh, arrived at an International Arctic Observations Assessment Framework, which has fed into a 10-year strategy for SEON, and then uh, most recently a roadmap task force, which is sort of the detailed implementation plan for that strategy. So a lot of documents, a lot of references, but it sets the rules, right? We understand what we want to achieve, and we're beginning to figure out how to actually take the concrete steps to achieve those goals. So how does this work in, in practice? I'll return to the, those two committees I mentioned earlier. There's a committee on observations and networks, or CON. They, they have um, several sort of guiding um, parameters here, conducting an inventory of observational assets, improving the network, so recruiting additional partners that are appropriate and consistent with the goals and the vision of the SEON. Again, sort of moving to the more challenging aspects, trying to maintain the sustainability, and I'll return to that towards the end. Um, but ultimately, really working towards improving the planning for current and future observational systems. So that's the CON, the Observations and Networks Committee. Um, with respect to the data, which is equally important in, in our minds, um, Arctic Data Committee has their own website as well, um, and they have very specific tasks that include mapping the Arctic data ecosystem, uh, developing common metadata elements, data publication, citation, network building, of course. Um, and they've also benefited from um, in-person meetings. There is an upcoming polar data forum uh, to be held in Finland uh, uh, in November this year. There's a website there with a little bit more information for anyone who has an interest in that aspect. But more broadly, even though we have these sort of subcommittees, well not subcommittees, but committees as part of the SEON that are driving specific tasks, there is also uh, an Arctic Observing Summit that is the annual um, gathering of stakeholders and partners and, and members um, where we come together in this high-level summit providing um, an opportunity for interaction, the community-driven science-based guidance for the design, implementation, coordination, you can read as well as I can, uh, in terms of the types of observation systems that, that need to be put in place and how we actually go about putting them into practice. And so um, what I want to conclude in with my last couple of minutes is, is sort of highlighting the opportunities and challenges of this type of effort. I think uh, within the Arctic observing community, oppor opportunities and benefits are relatively clear. That include enhancing scientific understanding of environmental change across the Arctic and its impacts on the global system, um, definitely increasing or having more effective and efficient use of data available, although some of the challenges with that, uh, not explicitly labeled here, include you know, differences in national policies for, for, for data access and management. We've heard a little bit about differences in national policies already. Uh, that certainly is, is um, consistent with, with our experience as here as well. Um, 
The other and certainly improved benefit or opportunity is maximize societal benefit of observation system investments. There's really been a push in recent years since the, the STIPI uh, assessment, observation assessment framework to look at uh, societal benefit areas and how observations can inform uh, decision uh, can help with decision support, can, with improving forecasting and modeling, um, so that there is these, what in NSF parlance uh, would be considered broader impacts. Um, the challenges, of course, um, I think won't be um, new to anyone. How do we identify and motivate different disparate Arctic observing communities to lead and manage networks? Um, touched upon briefly, working across nations, across time zone, across cultures and languages can be certainly challenging in that reflect in, in that respect. Um, and what is often needed in these types of efforts are, are champions. Champions who are really motivated, incentivized to, to take that leadership role and have good who has good who have good managerial and time uh, management skill sets to motivate others as well to achieve these these goals. And um, goes, you know, without saying, you know, how can we ensure the sustainability with respect to financing uh, of the necessary long-term observations, especially in times of resource limitations and competing priorities? Uh, that can be many different things depending on, 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 on your, your context and position. Um, but um, one of the things uh, being part of a, f you know, a funding agency is that if I receive the right proposals, we can make important contributions from the U.S. to the larger SEON initiative. Um, and I'll add that this year there was a, a Horizons 2020 uh, call for proposals that really uh, was geared and aligned with many of the SEON vision and uh, goals. So um, I think my time is up for now, and uh, happy to take questions alongside Guy. Um, thank you for your time. So I also want to remind participants that are watching remotely that you can submit questions and, and we'll make sure they get addressed. Um, so I want to open it up for questions, but I want to broaden it as well. So we're talking about, you know, missions and goals, but we can really address any topic we've covered today or that we've been discussing. And so ask your questions of these two, but also feel free to share your own experiences and ask questions of one another so we can get a discussion going again. So I open the floor. Roberto, that was the, sort of the, I think the most depth that we've gone into with respect to governance. Um, so I, I have a question about that. Um, and we were invited to talk about our own personal experience. So um, in, uh, when I've been involved with large consortia with the NIH, virtually every person that's brought into the room is a PI that's been that's received an award uh, and the idea is that we form some type of steering committee and we arrive at decisions by consensus and the problem with that is that we in general use uh, uh, consensus style that's pretty much if, some, if one person objects then we don't go in a certain direction and it's not uncommon for somebody to uh, you know push th an agenda that is least disruptive to them let's say um, or if there's sort of a technical implementation that's part of their research and they're wedded to it's hard for them to sort of let go of that so it, I, 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 it seems like you have a, a, a dizzy, dizzying le level of, of, um, of governance structures and it, how do you deal with it it sounds like a, at some point there's so many people involved there must be a point at which at, at some committee has to be somebody has to be able to override somebody else so what does that look like or is it the same thing for you um, no, no, that's, a, that's an excellent question um, and so there I, I didn't get into too much I mean sort of I outlined the structure but there is a chair and a vice chair these are international uh, individuals um, uh, the vice chair is from the United States. The, the chair is from Iceland, if I'm not mistaken, right now. Uh, these are rotating positions as well. But so when there is an issue of contention where there isn't consensus, you know, um, initially there, there are, um, we have monthly calls, for example, board meetings, everyone weighs in. Uh, well, the expectation is that everyone weighs in, but in reality, not everyone weighs in. There are different levels of engagement. Uh, sometimes that depends, sometimes some country representatives are consistently not engaged or more engaged. Age, again, depending on the particular issue, but ultimately, so there it, there is an effort to have some discussion, weigh the pros and cons of the decision uh, for the particular issue, but ultimately, um, you know, if there isn't consensus, there 
often is at least a trend or a slight majority one direction. Um, and then ultimately the, the chair and vice chair make the, the decision, the executive decision uh, to participate, join a new collaboration or a new activity, uh, you know, sort of uh, establish, stand up uh, a new roadmap task force, um, or participate in, in some type of activity. And so, um, yeah, there is an opportunity both for that sort of stakeholder engagement. Um, a lot of time, well, in some cases, uh, depending on the timing, there might be an opportunity to to go do a listening session or some, some breakout at the either the Arctic Observing Summit that happens uh, biannually, or the other time is on an annual basis that face-to-face -face meeting for the Sea on board is during the Arctic Science Summit Week. Um, and so that's an annual uh, event that, again, allows the opportunity for, for folks to come together and maybe cut a, I don't say cut a side deal, but have the, those 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 side conversations that aren't necessarily possible on your monthly go-to meeting, you know, WebEx, Zoom, Blue Jeans, whatever platform you use. And so that's how oftentimes these decisions get, get made. Two comments and then a question. First comment is it would be really interesting to put up the budget alongside these conversations because uh, I'm contrasting the previous conversation where the discussion at the 500K level is probably slightly different than what you're talking about, Roberto, maybe by a factor of a couple of debt, you know. So it's just interesting that price points matter in terms of governance. Um, uh, the second observation is this is a really challenging one for me to get a, a, a grasp with because the detailed case study of a large scale activity and the small scale overview of a, a, of a pervasive activity are very hard to reconcile. Mm -hmm. So here's the question to try to reconcile that. Uh, imagine that you had to take a bunch of stuff out, Roberto, uh, to, to keep that thing running. If you had to take a whole bunch of stuff out, could you do that? Could you tell us what, what's the core of your governance structure? What do you need to do to keep it? And, and, and then, uh, Kai, if you could say, what's the one thing that you'd want to add to make it work? Can you do that? And you do notice my questions are always in choice form. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. What to remove? Uh, actually, I want to respond to the original comment about the financing because that's the funny thing. There aren't dedicated funds to say on. Um, and so that's been – that was one con, – con, constraint or critique from the review, uh, the external review back in 16 was that this is an unfunded mandate uh, in large part. And so it's the, 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 the will, the, the wherewithal of different national representation. You know, they provide um, in-kind support, an office, uh, or in individual's time to be a chair or a vice chair or, or part of the executive committee. Um, and even for me, this is not part of my terms of reference as an Aon program director for NSF. This is an extracurricular activity, but because of my position as Aon program director and part of the U.S. Federal Interagency Arctic Observing Network, this is recognized by my office as an important a you know, asset, but it's not in my job description. And so um, I have to take that into account. But that may change, and so and so, it's similar for the other countries and for the other organizations that are involved here. Um, so, so that's the challenge. Although you know, we're trying to, to like uh, I think Claire mentioned, we're trying to tackle these these types of challenges. How can we make it a priority, uh, which it should be in my mind, um, so that we have dedicated resources, both personnel and time, as well as finances to support some of these. But, but you're right, you know, we are relying on uh, funded projects through my program, through NASA projects, NOAA projects, DOE projects, international uh, funding organizations. Um, so that's one part. Um, with respect to what I would take away, wow. Um, I, was, I was trying to make sure that you didn't look at it removed. I was like, what's the one thing you want to keep? The what would I want to keep? The thing that you have to hang on to when everything else is going away. This is the group of people that I have, to, or this is the mechanism that I can't let go of. The board. You need to have that board. That 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 board is really representative of the stakeholder because it's not just program officers or or even PIs necessarily. You have advisors to ministries, uh, people in, in in those positions uh, across across the the circumpolar Arctic. And so. I wonder if I can expand the question for yeah. you to talk more broadly about processes and and very concrete examples of mm -hmm. activities to arrive at a governance structure that suits people and also to deal with issues so that there is some shared leadership, that it's not all on one person? So um, 
I, I think this project or this constellation of projects is particularly unique in that that it is a global wicked problem. Um, it, it, it clearly isn't just about collaborating for the sake of bringing different people from different parts of the world. It's actually a problem that affects all of the world. Um, so as I heard you explain that to me, it was interesting how even in those high stake situations, there's still the socio-political aspect that, that, that enters, I mean probably more so than ever, enter into it that require that you eventually say somebody has to decide, mm -hmm. you know, instead of what is our collective agreement. And I think, I think with so many things these days, and the reason why we have these big, complex, wicked problems is because we can't come to rational consensus on what is it that affects all of us and what is the work that we have to do that impacts all of us. And I think there is an opportunity um, to really spend some time, and, and I, I almost can't get my head around the complexity of this sort of project, but it's almost one of those that requires mental modeling. You know, not just imagining what Iceland gets out of it and what Sweden gets out of it and, and Greenland, and I apologize if I'm, I'm minimizing the complexity of the problem, but rather what is the global problem that we all need to come to agreement on. Not consensus, agreement, not hierarchical decision making. That is really team science on the macro level. Um, we aren't just talking about a bunch of folks that are gonna meet in the conference room and figure out what we believe in. This has much higher stakes. And I think the, the magnitude of the problem and the um, impact of projects like this are so high that you really do have to get back to those simple terms. What do we all agree we're here to do? And how do we intend to do it so that we all benefit from it, rather than who has the loudest voice in the room and who has most of the money? That's the way I can respond to that. Online folks that they can submit questions and we do have one that came in now and so I'll read that. My question is about international networks at the high level that many networks exist, reaching the right people who are the ones doing the work is critical to accomplish a CellNet goals. How do you recommend ensuring that you are including researchers, not just the figureheads? We do plan to emphasize early career engagement. Any other ideas? Ask you to respond and then I'd ask some people in the audience to please respond as well. Ensuring that you include researchers, not just the figureheads. Um, I don't think that's uh, as difficult as it may sound, at least from an NSF perspective. Um, NSF is very good at outreach, in my opinion. Um, very well connected to research, different research communities. Um, a lot of what um, our, my office supports, what Claire's office supports, and other directors support, um, is driven by the researchers in large part. And so whenever there, there are new initiatives, uh, like an ExcelNet, like the big ideas navigating the New Arctic, there's often tremendous effort, uh, outreach, and communication from the NSF, from the program officers, from the research community themselves to help spread the word uh, and to bring in um, you know, NNA, I think, is a, Navigating the New York, excuse me, is a really great example. One of the, the aims was to promote a uh, more inclusive, diverse research community, not just your, your uh, longtime Arctic researchers, but bringing in folks uh, from outside the Arctic who are social scientists and, or social science researchers and economists and historians and political scientists or geographers just doing migrations, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, in this past year, because of the partial lapse in appropriations, that was limited, but um, the expectation, this is a five-year initiative, there will be uh, an expected second solicitation call for proposals, and the idea is, again, to really uh, R recruit uh, widely across different research communities, not just your, your traditional Arctic research. Guy, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, when I read this question, um, I'm drawn to the idea of international networks, which are very different than, you know, networks that occur within um, one country or jurisdiction, and also the idea of um, bringing in career 
people of different points in their careers. So, I mean, both of those um, uh, remind me of how the reward systems are so different <laughs> in different places in the world. Um, how you get from this point of your career to the next point, you know, not tenure, but just how you how you have a career um, are different. And um, it's important that any team, no matter how large, you know, reconcile how they are going to ensure that the things, the rewards and the recognitions that that is needed for the different team members is part of what is included in the collaboration plan. So that if you have early investigators, um, we'd like to be able to say it doesn't matter if you are part of a collaborative team you'll do fine, and we know that doesn't always work out. They might need to publish and be the first author. Well, why don't we prioritize that for a particular person? Um, or if it's a different type of um, reward arrangement, just being sensitive that the diversity of teams includes the diversity of career pathways that are present in these different teams and their different disciplines, and especially in international environments where it's not just the American system, it might be the system of 10 different countries. Um, people need to be able to have a pathway to advance in their career. And teams who recognize that tend to get the most out of their the workforce because you're tapping into the motivations that are most important to them as to why they want to collaborate pick up on that point because it's really important that there are uh, within different uh, countries different cultures and different systems and and so the question about the bringing in the figurehead speaks to the fact that many other countries have much more hierarchical systems than we do and there is an expectation that the um, most senior person is the person there even if they are a figurehead they need to be there and so it is an important question of uh, respecting different countries um, organizational structures for their um, research environments and ensuring that uh, you're sensitive to that but you also have all of the right people not just the figurehead but the real researchers who are going to carry out the work too so great question great point it's not unusual very practically speaking for a team that I'm on to sit down at the onset and say okay who who's going to take the lead on this paper and who is going to do what on this paper and and I I, I produced two papers in a row one year where the um, other per we just had an arrangement I'll take first authorship for this paper you take first auth authorship on the second paper and that may s seem like so you know basic but it's really important to be sensitive to those um, to those realities because otherwise you're not setting up um, an environment where people are going to want to collaborate over time they're going to get burned and not want to collaborate again or they're not going to find any um, reward in collaborating and they're going to start to isolate so here's a follow-up question that came in online. This is from Nancy Grin. She said, that's great, thanks. Good ideas about different reward systems in other countries. Also, this is relevant to the future Earth person's comments about developing countries. So thanks, Nancy, for that comment. I want to ask the group if, if we can get some examples of how to recruit those individuals who may become really valuable members of your network that you don't know. We worry about that constantly at Succinct, that we all tend to reach out to the people we know, yet there may be other individuals out there who are very creative, could commit a lot of time that we don't know. So any, anyone want to tell us about how they brought in new people into a network that they did not know? A lot of people do this, but we try and host symposia at various conferences, and that really broadens the appeal and, and the, uh, the swath of people that you interact with. So the research coordination network that I am PI of is genomes to phenomes to populations in a changing world. Um, so it's all of biology, right? Mm -hmm. And so we go to a number of different conferences in the year and we try and host a symposium at, at each one of those. So we'll go to ESA, we'll go to APS, we'll go to SICBI, 
and we get new memberships on a regular or new members on a regular basis that way we have run dozens and dozens and dozens of workshops through our project and we are always on the lookout for people in those workshops that seem to be leaders in the community that we're serving and we lean on those folks for plant for planning future workshops and for coming in and being trainers for us when we're trying to do that and sometimes when we're looking for people to hire we go to some of those folks and say why don't you put your name on the list because we want to hire them and um, I, for us it's really getting to know the community very very well and being very integrated into the community so that you see that talent coming up and then you go after that talent aggressively so that you can get them to join the team. And I'll just mention one of the things we've done at Sasink is because our teams here are so diverse, um, if someone wants to organize a workshop around their particular topic they're building a group around, we require that they can only identify a certain number of the individuals that will come and speak. And then we advertise that symposium and we invite applications to speak that describe very briefly in less than a page what they can contribute, what their their um, expertise is, etc. And it it brings in people you did not know existed and that's been that can be uh, pretty effective. I believe Leslie did you have a comment? Yeah I was just gonna say I think if you do effective outreach and you're a really good collaborator then people are going to come to you as well because the community out there is going to hopefully have your name in mind when a discussion comes up and someone says, "Oh, you should contact this person." You know, if you're if you're looking to achieve this goal. So, I mean, obviously we want to be out there looking for collaborators, but again, you know, if you if you create the right environment, the collaborators will come to you. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for a great session, both uh, Guy and Roberto and the group out here. Thank you.